at our final session. This really is, is, is the culmination, and hopefully this is going to really provide uh, a, a, a good way to, to weave a lot of the stuff together into the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation is considered a very enigmatic book. Uh, it's an enigmatic book uh, for a reason. Uh, first off, it's enigmatic uh, in that, yes, it can be difficult to understand, but it is not impossible to understand. In fact, as we read the intro, the prelude, the prologue, the, uh, the declaration is blessed. Blessed is the one who reads, who hears, and who heeds the words of this prophecy. And here's the other reality. Did you know that this book is written specifically for us in this age? This is a gift from the Father to the Son that He gave to John, uh, one of His witnesses, His sealed apostles, to deliver to His bondservants, the church. And so this is a book that has been specifically commissioned for us. If you're a believer, this is for us. It is for us to know what lies ahead. So <clears throat> when I was uh, a, uh, you know, a, young, uh, a young believer, uh, I uh, came to the Lord and I had a, a healthy interest in theology. And one of the things that uh, interested me uh, was uh, end times. I was, I was brought up in a, in a nominal Lutheran household, and so end times is something that I had no clue about. It was never, ever even brought up in church. And so uh, I was, there, there were these large chunks of, uh, of, of Bible passages that were just brand new to me. I, I didn't know they were there. So I started to dig into them, but I also visited my local bookstore. And... Uh, and got books from the prophecy section. And I pretty much, in my early days, was a pre-tribulational believer. Because at that point, to be honest, I really didn't know there were other options. <laughs> because every book that I got off of the shelf was pre-tribulational. And so as I started to read and go on more, I started to see some holes, but ultimately, you know, baby Christian, and like, well, these men are, pub they've got books published in Barnes and Noble and in, in, in Northwestern. I don't know if you've been around, but in the cities for a while, Northwestern used to be our, our Christian bookstore here. And so, and ultimately, I, I you know, started to have some misgivings. Uh, I, did, I started to see some real big problems. Uh, and it was actually, I, I started to read a book uh, that was a different perspective. And uh, it was ultimately what we're going to go over in this session that converted me to another position, the, the pre-wrath position. This was really the, the, the first thing that really, I, when I saw this, I kind of said, this, this has to be it. And from, I mean, that was 25 years ago or so, and for 25 years, again, there's been refinements in my view, but it, it, the, this view has been tested as far as what I've held, and it's only been strengthened over the years, not, in my estimation, weakened. So uh, we're going to go over the seals of the book of Revelation and look as we recall uh, Matthew 24 or the, uh, the Olivet Discourse. So... We are going to be referring back to the Olivet Discourse as we go through the seals. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> as I, uh, I don't know if I noted this in, in, a, in our big session, but uh, we are ultimately going to be getting 85-inch uh, monitors for both of these walls. So next uh, conference, as the Lord wills, uh, we'll be able to really have some nice visuals because uh, a lot of you are visual. And seeing a, uh, a timeline or, or a map can be very helpful. And so uh, we'll hopefully have those up and, and running soon. So, but today we're going to really just kind of go back and forth, remembering the birth pangs, the hard labor, and the celestial sign, and the rapture, resurrection rapture. That was the, 
uh, the progression that we saw in the Olivet Discourse. Birth pangs, which were false Christs, wars, rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes, then great persecution, abomination and desolation, great persecution, then the cry, or excuse me, then the, um, the celestial signs, and then the coming of Christ, and then the day of the Lord begins. So that was really a, a summary of not just Matthew 24, but a lot of what we've surveyed in our first five sessions. So hopefully this will tie up a lot of things and we will see that the book of Revelation, though crouched in more cryptic language, yes, the book of Revelation is a coded book. And if you're in my Bible survey classes, you're going to know this, this line, but there is a secret to decode the book of Revelation, and I'm going to give it to you. The secret to decode the book of Revelation is understanding the first 65 books of the Bible. <laughs> so if you're looking for something easy, okay, well, <laughs> it truly is. It's a coded book, and the way we understand the book of Revelation is by becoming intimately acquainted with the first 65 books of the Bible. And that's how it's coded. The, the bond servants know that which this is drawing from. The world looks at this, and they can't make heads or tails of it because they do not have the reference point, which, of course, is faith and understanding in the whole of God's Word. So <clears throat> let me just start by kind of talking, uh, taking us through the early chapters of Revelation, bringing us to chapter 6. Chapter 6 is where we're going to be doing our exposition. But we always want to do our best to contextualize things. Uh, taking passages out of context is oftentimes a, a way to, to get things wrong, uh, to miss things because as you remove them from their context, both their literary and historical context, that is where errors very easily can be made, eisegesis rather than uh, exegesis. So the, as mentioned, the book of Revelation is a gift. It's a gift that was given, it, its origins are with the Father. The Father gave this to the Son, and He then took it and gave it to John. Now, John is in exile on the Isle of Patmos. That's on the, west, uh, the western isles off of Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And this was like being in prison. He was, he was exiled. This is likely written around AD 95, under the reign of Domitian. There is a very early attestation by, I believe, Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers that noted that John wrote this during the reign of Domitian, which would have been around 95. So A.D. 95, John persecuted. Very possibly the last remaining apostle. And now the Lord is going to give this message which is going to reverberate for thousands of years, equipping and preparing His people for what is to come. So you have the two, after this, you know, the Lord appears in John. He appear, appears in kingly and priestly glory. There are, uh, he comes out of the midst of a, of a golden lampstand. And uh, really this is temple and priestly imagery that we see here. This is the kingly priest. And the seven golden lampstands, uh, although we might think of individual lamps, uh, the, the Jewish reader would have completely recognized a menorah. The seven golden lampstands, he's standing in the midst of a menorah, illuminating, again, God's, uh, God's dwelling. Now, this, this lampstand is uh, representative of the churches, the seven churches. So there are seven chosen churches, and I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday, seven chosen churches, uh, which are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are chosen, and they, they're emblematic. 
They are historical. These things were going on. They are emblematic of that which the Lord is exhorting all of the churches concerning what He loves, what He desires, and what He loathes and condemns. And they also point forward to the days of consummation, that these conditions are going to continue and even be heightened during the days leading to the end. That brings us to chapter 4. Chapter 4 now is where the vision begins. John is taken up to heaven. And chapters 4 and 5 are John being taken into the throne room of the Most High God, the throne room of the Father. Now remember I said the the way to understand the book of Revelation is understanding the first 65 books of the Bible. And this is true for Revelation 4 and 5. In fact, there is another vision in the Bible that very much mirrors Revelation 4 and 5, and that is Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel sees this one whom he describes that is like a son of man. By the way, in Revelation 1, John says, I saw one like a son of man, very clearly linguistically relating to Daniel. Now, this one like a son of man is just, this is a human. He looks like a human. Well, he is a human. And he comes to the father, who in, in Daniel, it's called, the, the, the father is called the ancient of days. In Revelation, the father is the one who sits on the throne. He approaches the throne in Daniel and, and receives from the father a kingdom, through which he also then distributes among the saints. All of this is in Daniel 7. And we have other imagery that speaks of a, uh, you know, a, a horn, and a beast. All of these things are woven into uh, the fabric of Revelation. So, in Revelation, there is a scroll in the hand of the Father. And... Uh, what does this scroll represent? Well, here's what I believe the scroll represents. There are three things that I think we need to grasp when it comes to this scroll. First off, concerning its seals. There are seven seals and one scroll. So keep in mind, this is not seven scrolls with seven individual seals. It is one scroll with seven seals that line the scroll. And these seals are preconditions that need to be met before the scroll is open. So all of the preconditions need to be met first, and then the scroll is opened. So what does the scroll contain? There are two th- matters that I believe the scroll contains. The first one is the trumpets, the wrath of God. The trumpets are that which the scroll scroll contains. Now, the seventh trumpet is the third uh, and very key point, which is going to connect us back to Daniel and also forward to the sounding of the seventh trumpet. This is an inheritance scroll. Once the contents of this scroll is emptied or read, then the inheritance is received to whom it is due. Now, Who is due the scepter? Jesus. In fact, this echoes all the way back to Genesis. Because when when John cannot uh, uh, take the fact that no one is worthy to open the scroll, he's thinking, the kingdom's not coming. God's name is not going to be vindicated in in, in the retribution of the world. And what's the good news? The good news is, weep no more, for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, by the way, that is the, the root of the name of this church, is conquering king fellowship. The lion of the root of David of the line of Judah. Judah and David, when you see those names, think kingship in the Bible. 
The scepter will not depart from Judah until it comes to, or until Shiloh comes, and he is the one who is going to reign. He receives this inheritance of reigning over the kingdom. So when he says the line of the uh, of the tribe of Judah, it's tying it back to the promise of a kingdom, a scepter. When the when the trumpets are finished, the final trumpet is. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So this scroll, three things, seals, preconditions, content, trumpets, culmination, inheritance, okay? The lamb, the lamb breaks the seals, leads the charge of the trumpets, and receives ultimately the inheritance. Now again, remember Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, the Son of Man goes up to the Ancient of Days, and what does he receive from the Ancient of Days? A kingdom. In this, the Lamb goes up to the one who sits on the throne and receives a scroll. (laughs) Parallel. Daniel helps us understand. Revelation. Now furthermore, Uh, At the end of chapter 5, turn to Revelation 5. Remember, the saints are going, uh, Daniel 7 declares that the saints are going to reign with this Son of Man. The kingdom is going to be given to the saints. Now, when the Lamb takes the scroll, the heavenly song is thus in verse 9. The heavenly song, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain by your blood. You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a what? Kingdom. And priest to our God, and they will what? Reign. Where? That's what we were talking about, the millennial and beyond. It isn't that we go up there to live with God, quote-unquote, up there forever. Our world, our kingdom is going to be in the new heavens and new earth forever. And we're going to reign on the earth. God comes down to dwell with us, Revelation 21. The dwelling of God is with man. So... For us to get to this point now, there is a process, and that is what Revelation chronicles in John's vision. This progression of seals, of trumpets, of bowls. And so let's begin with the first seal. Now as we track through this, I'm just going to give some general commentary uh, on the, the nature and dynamics of what unfolds here. Now quite often within the the realm of inheritance scrolls, usually a condition is met and then a seal is broken. And it's reversed here. So when you see a contrast or a reversal, usually something's going on. So it isn't that something happens and then the lamb breaks a seal. It's what? The lamb breaks the seal And then the condition happens. I do think this highlights that though these are uh, things that are happening that are bringing about birth pangs and tribulation upon the world, they are under the Lord's sovereignty. This isn't something that God is reacting to. He is ultimately in control, even in the midst of, uh, of, of, of great distress and persecution. So let's start with The first seal, I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So this is, along with the the two real enigmatic uh, seals, in my estimation, are are one and four. Four is the toughest, I believe, but, but one is also one that has lent to various interpretations. Ultimately, what I do think assists us in this is the mirroring that goes on with the Olivet Discourse. So some have said this is, this is Christ, white horse. 
Now, the, the problem with this, I, I believe, is within the narrative, you have already Christ active here, and he's the lamb breaking the seal that brings this about. So the, uh, I think the best interpretation here, we have a white horse, which of course is something that we see uh, also in this book later on. The Lord is going to be on a white horse, but it's later on in chapter 19. So given the first birth pang that the Lord said, remember when they asked, what will be the the sign of the end of the age and your coming? The first thing Jesus said, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ and will mislead many. And so... I think the best understanding of this first seal is the ultimate false Christ. And we know from Revelation 13 and Daniel that this one is one that goes forth to conquer. He goes forth to conquer. That is a description of the beast in chapter 13. So, again, Matthew, the first birth pang, false Christs. First seal, something that resembles the Christ, but within the framework and within the parallelism, this appears to be one who is false. Second seal. Verse 3, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slay one another. And he was given a great sword. So the removal of peace, the slaying between humans and a great sword, all three of these things are descriptions of war. Now, the second thing Jesus noted in the birth pangs was you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not alarmed. The third seal. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I look and behold a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. This is cryptic language, especially for us. What's a denarii? You know, and uh, we aren't, usually most of us, I don't think, are in, in, the, in the peasant, quote-unquote, business of making our own bread. At least not in the way they used to. You might have bread makers, but that wasn't the tried and true way of doing bread. <laughs> but ultimately what this indicates, it's, it's a full day's wages for enough to make a loaf of bread. So vastly inflated food prices. Jesus' third, quote-unquote, birth pang is there will be famines, and earthquakes, along with war. So you start to see, again, as I was seeing these parallels for the first time, I was saying, boy, this is really compelling. Now, the the biggies are yet to come, as far as the parallels. But the birth pangs line up, really, ideally. The first three seals... Now, one, one notation before we move on, the uh, do not harm the oil and the wine is a very, very difficult passage to understand, uh, just because there's a few different ways this, that this could be noted. Um, oil and wine, some have said, well, this, these are luxury items. Now, the truth is, is yeah, we might think, it, it, first off, this isn't speaking of petrol. They didn't have petrol back then. This isn't talking about that the gas prices at, the, uh, at BP are skyrocketing. This is uh, olive oil. The the Greek is, this is olive oil. Uh, And then, of course, wine. Now, again, I I still wrestle with this. One of the main things that strikes me here is 
barley and uh, and wheat <clears throat> uh, are are both elements used to create. You're, you're not eating these things on their own. They need to be made, prepared, turned into bread, or what or or what have you. Whereas both oil and wine, oil in this context comes from olives, <clears throat> and wine comes from grapes. So it, it has to do with something that has already been pressed, because both the wine or both the olives and the the wine are things that would have already been pressed. So uh, it's it's I, I don't know if it has to do with whether this is something that is preserved, things that are already preserved. Uh, made and preserved, or something else. But nevertheless, the element of famine, as well as preservation, is at work here. Do not harm the oil and the wine. So uh, beyond that, uh, at this point, I, I don't like to tread beyond what I think is, uh, is, can, can be compelling. So I'm waiting personally for further insight concerning that. But nevertheless, I think it is clear that this is speaking of Food shortages, famine. Now that brings us to what I, th- I think to be one of the, the most difficult. Um, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and behold, a pale horse and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now, by the way, the wild beast is not in there. It's beasts. It's just beasts of the earth. So, the reason why this is, is difficult, the, the main difficulty here is fourth of the earth. What is that referring to? Now, note here, this text does not say a fourth of the earth were killed, okay? It's an important distinction because later on in Revelation, we do see explicit declarations where people are killed, and it's, uh, again, a third of humanity was killed. This is that authority was given over a fourth of the earth to go forth and kill with these means. The other aspect concerning that, that uh, gives expositors pause here is, is fourth of the earth here, fourth of the whole world, or fourth of the land? And again, it's gar, which uh, can mean world, and most of the time in the book of Revelation it does mean the, the world in its scope, but it could also just mean land. Could it be referring to the promised land? Don't know. Uh, again, the fourth dynamic is something that is uh, a bit difficult. It, could it be referring to population? That's another very popular interpretation. Is there a fourth of the earth's population that the beasts and this death in Hades are looking to persecute or kill? Now, Along with this, there are a couple things that I want us to, uh, to note. First off, and I th- this ultimately proves helpful, I'm convinced that this fourth seal, in whichever way it is speaking of, is related to the onset of the Great Tribulation. Because that's what follows next in Jesus' flow. You have that, you you have this beasts of the earth, which is in in the in the Greek. The only other times we see this in in Revelation, the the term beasts or beast, is with the Antichrist, the false prophet, or his kingdom. So usage there points to the rising of the beast. The other interesting thing about this is the, the list here. Of, of sword, famine, and pestilence is something that in the Old Testament is really rooted around Jerusalem's fall. Jerusalem's fall is really rooted here, which, what do we know? When what have we read in, in, in Luke and in Matthew? What happens at the midpoint? Antichrist sets himself up in the temple. It's an abomination that brings about desolation. So, Exactly, once again, how and where these things link, there can be a bit of debate, but I am convinced that they are ultimately related 
to the events that occur around the midpoint, the onset of the Great Tribulation, which speaks of the fall of Jerusalem as well as the persecution of God's people. This lines up with what Jesus has declared. And furthermore, when we get to the fifth seal, remember, what did Jesus declare was going to happen during this time of great tribulation? So we have birth pangs, false Christs, wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes, abomination of desolation, Great tribulation, and he said, they will deliver you over to tribulation. You will be hated by all uh, nations on account of my name. They will put you to death. Let's read the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the... A witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So the fifth seal is in the midst of a time as we track this with the Alva Discourse, where there is a great persecution, unlike there has ever been and never will be again. And we have this cry of the martyrs. A very key thing here. This fifth seal cries out for God's wrath. And what is the response? Is it... It's already been going on. Take a look. The world's being judged. Not at all. What are they told to do? Wait. It hasn't started yet. And the Lord is in control. It isn't until the last martyr that is destined to give their lives will die that the Lord is going to intervene and then go to war, and this great transition is going to begin. The most amazing and greatest administration transition of all time. I want to talk a little bit about the nuances here in the fifth seal. I wrote a little bit on this, in uh, uh, Alan has his new periodical, and I wrote an article for that, and the thematic elements are, are, are here, and I get into this passage. And there's a really interesting nuance here. Now, the souls here, that soul, uh, the Greek word can mean life, simply life. We often think of, you know, a disembodied ghost or something like that. But but, uh, suke, life, is that's what's seen as life. And I think something else is going on because notice where... The, this, these souls or lives are. They're at the foot of the altar. Now, when I was, again, this is eisegesis. When I was first reading this, I thought, okay, remember I was brought up Lutheran, so there was an altar up front, and it was hollow underneath, so as kids we could run under it uh, in, in church. And so I thought, well, maybe the altar is a nice, safe place to be. And again, this is, again, eisegesis. What is an altar? An altar is a place of what? Sacrifice. Yeah, so I I wasn't seeing lambs and bulls and goats being slaughtered on this thing. It was just a place where the pastor was every week. (laughs) But an altar is a place of sacrifice. So that imagery is important because it's at the, it's not necessarily underneath, but it is at the foot of the altar. Now, at the foot of the altar is where the what would go? The blood. Now, once we realize that, there's some amazing connections here. So at the foot of the altar, you have the lives. Now, what does the scripture say? Life is in the blood. The lives crying out for justice. What does that reflect back to? Where else do you read of blood crying out? Abel. The what? First martyr. 
tracing us all the way back to the first martyr. It's an illusion. But what does he say? It isn't until the last martyr gives his life, then I will judge the earth. Waiting. And it isn't long at this point. It's about to unfold. And now we get to our fulcrum. Guess what the next seal is? Let's read it. The sixth seal. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and powerful and every slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling on the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the land, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? The sun will be darkened, the moon will be turned to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So these ones that are diving into the rocks recognize this is the great and terrible day of Yahweh, Israel's God. And he is going to go to war. Who can stand? The rhetorical answer is no one. So this is the... the, 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 nearest, the, the, the nearest illusion here, again, we have kind of various uh, nuances to the, uh, the celestial disturbances, but this is the closest that is directly related, you know, outside of Acts 2, uh, to Joel's prophecy. The moon will turn blood. That is distinctive of Joel. So that this is that which is occurring directly before the day of the Lord begins is definitive. Now they are, the, the, the world when seeing this, they're diving into the rocks. Hide us. Now remember, I want us to juxtapose this to what we read in Luke earlier today. When we see these things, are we to dive into rocks? Straighten up. Lift up your head. Your redemption has drawn Near. Now, remember, the, the, the martyrs were given white robes. And this white robe is a key thematic thread in the book of Revelation. Now, again, context will always determine and sometimes white robes are just donned by heavenly beings. But when, it's, when, the, when it is attached to the saints, it is speaking of primarily uh, redemption and resurrection. Note the, the martyrs were given white robes. It, wasn't say they, it didn't say they donned them. They were granted these white robes and told to wait. So, again, this is the big link to the Alva Discourse, by the way. We have subtle links that are still strong. False Christs, wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes, first, second, third seal, fall of Jerusalem, great persecution, fourth and fifth seal, then the celestial signs. It is that that really connects. It's a connective, cohesive tissue that binds Revelation to the Olivet Discourse, to Thessalonians, to Isaiah, to Joel, etc. So the day of the Lord is about to unfold. The The great day of their wrath has come. Now we are hit with an interlude. Chapter 7 is an interlude between the 6th and the 7th seal. Now remember, the 7th seal is the last seal that needs to be broken. Then what happens? The scroll is opened, and the trumpet judgments unfold. The day of the Lord begins. Chapter 7 is all about this. Chapter 7 is about preservation from God's impending wrath. This whole chapter, that is the reason for this interlude, God's wrath is about to unfold, And chapter 7 speaks of two groups that are exempted from the wrath of God. Now, the first one we see in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, and that is the infamous and famous 144,000. 
12,000 from each tribe that are sealed. Now, they remain on this earth. Now, who are they? We're not going to get too much into this because just read them and believe what it says, okay? Amen. There are 144,000 Israelites, 12,000 from each tribe. That's who they are. And notice what is said. Verse, um, in verse 3, they say, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the tree until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So a seal marks ownership and also denotes protection. Don't harm this until we are able to mark those whom the wrath is not to touch. This is reflective of things we read, actually, uh, during the time of the fall of Jerusalem, by the way, in Ezekiel. Of course, this is on a cosmic scale here. Then we get to this other group. So that is the preserved at this point on earth. And what happens? What happens after the sign in the sun, moon, and stars? What have we seen in Thessalonians? What have we seen in Luke and in Matthew? The Lord gathers his people at the what? Parousia. The parousia happens here. And when Alan went through 1 Thessalonians 4, remember, we are left unto the parousia of the Lord. You, you have to create two future comings. There needs to be a, 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 it's a noun, a, a, a second parousia, and then a third parousia, which the Bible simply does not support if you're going to preserve this. There is one noun, event, parousia, that begins sometime in the second half of Daniel's 70th week. So what is really the first thing that we read of after these celestial signs present themselves? It is the resurrection and the gathering. Now, we don't have a chronicling of either the resurrection or the gathering. We find those in... Matthew 24, that's the gathering. The resurrection is clarified in, for sure, in 1 Thessalonians 4. We have the ultimate result. Remember what is said in 1 Thessalonians 4. We will will be gathered to the Lord and we will be with Him forever. Now, in verse 9, remember this is right after the sixth seal. After this... I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the Lamb, clothed in what? White robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. And then we see in verse 13, one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know, and he said to me, These are the ones who come out or have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Then we see that they are before the throne of God. They will neither hunger, uh, thirst, sun will not strike them, nor scorching heat. The Lamb in the midst of their throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That is the guiding to New Jerusalem, by the way. Who is this? Follow the the connections. It is a consistent parallelism that does not need to be forced in the least bit. There is a gathering, there is a resurrection at an unknown day or hour. Sometime after the abomination of desolation, and lo and indeed behold... There is a great multitude that no one can count from what? Every tribe, nation, and tongue. This is the resurrected church. Now, from where did they come? They came out of the midst of the great tribulation. Now, remember what we read concerning the rapture and resurrection. By the way, we often use those two as synonymous, but they really aren't. They are related very closely, but they're distinct. The resurrection is the rising to life, our bodies being raised unto new life. A rapture is being caught up. It is speaking of a spatial movement being caught up where resurrection is speaking of the the quality 
It's a qualitative state. We go from death to life. Now, again, they're related because those that are resurrected are then raptured. But notice the time period. They come up out of the Great Tribulation. That time period that is stressed throughout the Scriptures. It is out of that time of great persecution, of great trial, of great what? Hard labor. That new life, eternal life, comes about. This is us. We are going to be resurrected. If you believe in Christ, true God, true man, crucified, died on the cross, taking our sin, nailing it to the cross, and giving us His righteousness. If you believe in Christ, who is ascended and returning, repenting of your sins and believing in Him, you have this promise. He's going to raise you unto life. He is going to catch you up to Himself, and you'll be forever with Him. Doing things and seeing things that we can't even imagine. We really can't grasp what God has prepared for us. We have peaks. But the lamb is going to return. He is also a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And this is our, indeed, living hope. Our blessed hope. And I'll finish on this and then we'll, we'll open it up. I want to talk about our blessed hope. Because so often I hear this, well, how can this be a blessed hope? If one has to go through such great trial and tribulation concerning this, it's not a blessed hope, it sounds terrible. And it ultimately betrays our, first off, it's, it's painfully Western and overly comfortable. It demonstrates we are spoiled sometimes spoiled rotten. Because the truth is, is to think that somehow we're exempt from tribulation and trial when right now, at this very time, our brothers and sisters throughout the world are being arrested, are having their property seized, are being put to death right now. We don't have to look forward in the future to say, well, this might come sometime. It's already happening to our brothers and sisters. Our family members who we just haven't met yet our eternal family members. Would we look at them and say this is not a blessed hope to them? No, in the midst of such trial, do you think this hope becomes less of a blessed hope or more of a blessed hope? When we realize how polluted, how corrupt, how worthless the things of this world are, We loosen our grip on them and we cling to that which is eternal. And so what our blessed hope is, and here's, I'll I'll end with this, our blessed hope, this is what we need to start thinking about. It's not just about us and how we feel. You know what it's about? What is that which the Lord taught us to pray first for? Remember he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, is it, Help me be comfortable and live a good, best life now. No. Our Father who art in heaven, may your name be hallowed throughout all of the earth. And that is what our blessed hope should be. Rather than thinking, of, oh, this is so hard for me. And I get this. We're human. We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. We're going to think like this. But the more our minds are renewed and are looking for not our glory, but the glory of the king, we realize our hope is that not that we have, that we just have constant comfort, but rather the name of our great and glorious God is honored throughout all of the earth. And that's going to happen when he shows up. No longer will the name of the Lord be blasphemed without consequence. But his name is going to be proven holy, not only throughout the nations, but in us as well. He is going to work in us and bring us to life eternal. And we are going to indeed have everlasting comfort when we are with the Lord. 
That is our hope. So loosen your grip on the things of this world. Love not the world. Instead, may our hearts, may our minds, may all of our efforts be directed towards the King of Kings.